Are you kidding me? Sleepwalking? Sleepwalking. Sleepwalking. Like the plot of a science fiction movie. I didn't know it was, was I? A lot of suspects might say, no way, you got the wrong guy. Scott just keeps saying, I don't remember. Scott Flater, you know, made a statement. You know, I hope that guy. I went to bed as a 12-year-old kid. And I woke up to a police officer telling me that my mother died. Pretty rocks, which is why people come here. There's our driver. <laughs> Start her up, Mike. You guys want to get together for a big old group shot? Yeah, we can do that. Can I take pictures? That'd be great. <laughs> the Felater family is living in Arizona. Scott Felater is a successful engineer. He's working at Motorola. Yarmola Felater pretty much is in charge of the kids. It's not on. Yes, it is. <laughs> Michael is 12, he's your typical boy, and then you have Megan Filator, she's 15. Scott and Yarmula have been happily married for over 20 years, and Scott calls her Yarm for short. Tierra Bueno, that's Spanish for good land. It's, uh, it's a residential neighborhood, middle class. Northeast Phoenix at that time had a reputation to be a very safe, quiet community. We don't usually respond there. It's not a, a high crime area you normally work. My name is Michael Flair. My father is Scott Flair. In 1997, I was 12 years old. My father was hard at work. He was a product engineer for Motorola. Religion was always important to my family. We were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was teaching early morning seminary, so he would wake up and he'd be teaching the seminary at 6.15. He'd drive my sister to school and then he would drive to work and he'd usually be home for dinner. January 16th, it was a typical Thursday for my family. I recall having a family dinner. After dinner, I went and worked on the computer to prepare for the next day's church class. And then the kids went to bed at 9 o'clock. It's been a long day at work. He's prepping for his religious education class. And now his wife... On the couch with ER on television. And I woke her up and kissed her goodnight, apologized for not fixing the pool filter, told her I'd get to it the next day, and went to bed myself. I was really exhausted and crashed in bed. I would guess it was between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. Greg Coons and Stephanie Reedhead live next door to the Filators. Greg and I were getting ready to go to bed somewhere a little after 10, probably 10, 1030. And then I heard moaning or crying or something. And then I told Greg, I think it was something outside. We just really didn't want to be nosy neighbors or be, you know, eavesdropping. But Greg thought, you know, hopefully this isn't something bad happening and and so he went and looked over the wall what the neighbor sees is a body of yarmula flater just lying there he thinks that maybe this is someone who's and drags her to the edge of the pool he then seems to roll her body yeah my biggest concern was just to get the officer Officer Stanowitz arrived on scene. We went over the wall. The suspect at the time uh, was unaccounted for. We did not know where he was at. I had no idea how dangerous. It's partially open. We stepped in, and from what I recall, almost immediately I, I recognized Scott Filater at the top of the stairs, wearing a crisp white T-shirt, red flannel, pajamas, and he made remarks to the extent of, What's going on? What are you doing in my house? Why are you here? I was just hopelessly seeing how many people were in the house. He told us four. We asked him who, and he said it was his family, his wife, two kids, and himself. Well, at that point, I had observed his wife. Um, with the amount of blood, I knew that she was gone. <clears throat> the arm was out in the backyard, hurt. 
and that they were working on her. Took him out to the patrol car to secure him in the back of the patrol car. Then it came to sweeping the house, and that's when I learned of Michael Flater and Megan Flater asleep in their rooms upstairs, and they were still asleep. Thank God they were fine. They weren't. They were untouched, unscathed. The next thing I recall is a, a police officer waking me up sometime very early in the morning, telling me that my parents had gotten in a fight and had a disagreement. I thought that was all odd because I had never seen my parents fight or argue. I was concerned about their welfare and their mental state and trying to protect them as much as possible and minimize what they have to see or hear at that moment in time. We went out and then that police officer walked away. I went to bed as a 12 year old kid with a happy life and I woke up to a police officer telling me that my mother died and it's everything that you think it would be and more. After Scott's arrested, he's taken downtown for one of the oddest and shortest interrogations we're used to seeing. And believe it or not, police will focus on a Band-Aid. So when Band-Aid came in? My name's John Norman. I was the case agent on the Scott Filator case. I was uh, working homicide detail for Phoenix PD. I had seen the word homicide all over the place as I walked into the room. So right at the beginning of the interrogation, I asked the detective, I said, you know, I, I'm assuming that Yarm is dead since this is homicide. And he said, yes, she is. Obviously, you think I did it. I don't know what makes you think that. Uh, none of our neighbors would lie, especially about something that serious. And that threw me for a loop. He is almost in a fetal position, curled up in that corner, looking stunned, disbelieving that he's in this situation. And he just seemed to meekly accept what Detective Norman was saying, was that you just murdered your wife. This interrogation is unusual. A lot of suspects might say, no way, you got the wrong guy, I would never. But Scott just keeps saying, I don't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember doing it. You remember more than that. No. Well, my approach with Scott was not if you did it, it's why you did it. We're trying to look for a motive why he did it. Something set you off, Scott. Looks to me like he's been caught in a trap, trying to figure a way out. It's just to me. You know, he never looks at me when he's talking to me. He's got his head on the wall, he's got his hands up like this. He's very evasive. All I could say was, I don't remember doing anything like that. Nothing that's related to hurting, to you, hurting your arm at all. I just don't know. I loved her. I've been married all my adult life. She certainly didn't deserve to die. I don't know what happened. She's a good wife. Great mother. I don't like kids. Uh, On Scott's crisp white shirt or his red pajama bottoms, but Detective Norman sees some on his neck. Here. I didn't know there was blood on me. I'm sorry, I didn't know there was blood on me. He didn't know it was there, no. I was thinking, you didn't take a good enough shower. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Did you cut your hand? He's truly disoriented and confused, or maybe he's cooking up a defense on the spot. 
forget that too. Uh, I don't remember putting it on. I was open and shut because I'm thinking, well, he's going to be fingerprinted, photographed, and booked into jail on murder one. And he'll need a really good attorney to defend him. Well, you got the blood on the back of his ear there. You got to take a swab of that. To, you got to verify that that's the wife's blood. The story that was his name was Scott for later. Pretty much. Yeah. I didn't need to hear any more. So I was done. Papers, zombie, pushing her in the pool. Yes, sir. Well, actually, it's a lot more described than that. I was under the impression that she had drowned. After the interrogation, it had not dawned on me that she had been stabbed at that point. Scott is arrested, he's charged with first-degree murder, and if convicted, he is facing the death penalty, potentially. So he's decided he's going to go public. Oh, Miss Chung, Scott for later. And tell his stunning side of the story somewhere else on 2020. I know the truth was that I went to bed, and when I woke up, my wife is dead, and the cops had me on the floor. What happened between them, I don't know. In 1999, almost two years after Yarmula's murder. The stories that touch your life. This is 2020. 2020 producer Janice Tomlin and correspondent Connie Chung went to Arizona to cover the Philater story as Scott was awaiting trial. The kids wanted to visit their father and that visit was set up. And we were allowed to be there for it. How are things going? I missed English and biology, but I think that's okay. And it was through glass. Oh. My turn. Okay. Love you, sweetheart. I can't imagine how difficult that was for them. I... We wanted to interview the kids because they were the other two people in that house. We wanted to see if they could shed any light at all on why what happened happened. After you went to bed at 9 o'clock, what was the next thing you remember? Waking up at around 1.30. Why did you wake up? A police officer came and woke me up. They were resigned to the fact that their mom was gone, but they were desperate to try to save their dad. I mean, that was the only parent they had left. Michael, are you aware of the fact that if your father is convicted of first-degree murder, that the prosecutor could ask for the death penalty? Mm, yeah. Have you prepared in your mind for that prospect? Not really. I can't see my father killing my mother intentionally. That is not like my father. My father was not a violent person. They never argued. It doesn't jive with what I remember about my childhood. Do you love your wife? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I loved her a great deal. She was my best friend. If any two people were met for each other from the very beginning, it was those two. Scott Felater was born in the Chicago area. Scott was never much of a kid that went out on dates, but he saw Yarmula at school, in high school. Yarmula remembered that one of the things that first charmed her about Scott Felater was that he would fall asleep during English class, that he had a habit of dozing off during the middle of the day. And he decided that that's the one he liked, so he asked her to go out, and that was the first date for him, and he never went out with anybody else after that. In his entire life? No, he never did. I married her at age 20, and she's been there for me my entire adult life. 
they were both Catholic. They were both raised Catholics. And sometime before they married, Scott came across some missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he converted to that church. 1981, Scott and Yarmula started their family with daughter Megan, and three years later, Michael was born. She was an excellent mother, real fantastically devoted to the kids. When our second was born, she gave up her career to be a stay-at-home mom. Scott Felater and Yarmula Felater moved to Phoenix because of his job. They became involved in the LDS community, which is fairly sizable here in Arizona. Scott Felater works as an engineer at Motorola, and he's a successful engineer. He's a product manager in charge of a computer chip. In the never expressed any dissatisfaction with her marriage. And I would say, come on, Yarmala, there's got to be something that drives you nuts, you know? And she would just say, no, nope, he's just a really great guy. I had a father that worked hard and supported the family and a stay-at-home mom who was always there when I came home from school. It was a very loving home. One of the most popular places in Arizona to visit is Sedona, Arizona. It's beautiful with red rocks. The Felater family meet up with their extended family members from California in Sedona, Arizona, and they take what's called a pink Jeep tour. See this drop off. Do you remember that trip, Michael? Yeah. Tell me about it. I remember me and Dad having a lot of fun just like getting bounced around in the Jeep. Michael Felater described that day as one of the most family lives shattered by a tragedy. It's a tragedy that the neighbor actually witnesses. You see it, thanks. And he tells his story to the jurors on the stand. He is grabbing all over head holding it under the water. The trial was a sensation. It drew an incredible amount of interest, not because of the crime itself, but because of Scott Felater's defense. There is a defense strategy that sounds at first like the plot of a science fiction movie. Not to sound flip. You do realize how unbelievable this defense sounds. Uh, of course I do. Of course I do. I sort of feel like an idiot sitting here talking about it, and I sure wouldn't be if I didn't think it was true. Authorities say Scott Felater stabbed his wife over and over and then held her head underwater. But in a bizarre twist, he is not denying it. You have to know an intent to kill somebody to be guilty of murder. And he was in an unconscious state when he killed her and therefore was not guilty of the crime. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. It is a high-profile trial that's already received national attention, and it's set to begin in just about an hour. Scott Felater will go before a jury that will decide whether he should be convicted in the death of his wife. Why are you asking for the death penalty? Here's a man who did not have a criminal record. We need to focus on the victim at some point. This is a woman who suffered for approximately 15 minutes at the hands of her husband. But, uh, Mr. Martinez, are you ready to proceed with your opening statement at this time? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Juan Martinez was known as a bulldog prosecutor who had never lost a murder case. Juan came out, you know, gun blazing. Good afternoon to uh, all of you. This individual here, the defendant, Scott Lomas Fowler, in a sense, baptized his wife, Carmel Fowler, into the afterlife. And it all started at about 10 o'clock in the uh, evening in one of the remote areas, one of the darker areas of their backyard next to the pool pond. I wanted them to believe that this is something that he wanted to happen. This is something that wasn't a mistake. Your name, sir? I'm Philip Earl King, and I'm the chief medical examiner. The medical examiner testified that Yarmula Felater had 44 stab wounds. Most of them were defensive wounds, but some were fatal. And with regard to these uh, 44 wounds that we've been talking about, uh, the 44 include the cuts to the hand, correct? Yes, they do. Based on what the medical examiner told us about the stab wounds, we believe that once he had her near the pole pump, he actually put his left arm around her mouth so that she wouldn't scream. That tore me apart. 
I saw the very first picture and I couldn't take any more. And it's been however long it lasted, just looking at the table in front of me. I could not look up. I just, I don't want to remember you on that way. Well, if you're sitting in the courtroom hearing the evidence, it's very hard to get past anybody stabbing someone else 44 times, much less, you know, husband stabbing his wife 44 times. And then he had his bombshell witness, the next door neighbor, Greg Coons. And who are the neighbors to these cities? Scotch and Yarmouth for later. And uh, throwing your attention back to January 16th of 1997. Based on his testimony, he did not see the initial attack. I saw a person laying on the ground, uh, heading towards the house, feet towards the pool equipment. My impression was that she was drunk. There wasn't any evidence presented by anybody as to how the two of them got outside uh, and how the scenario was that he ended up stabbing her. And walked through my field of view. The prosecution is trying to make the case that Scott is wide awake, fully conscious, and doing a series of tasks in the minutes after the attack on his wife. I came out of the bathroom, shut the light off, walked through the bedroom, shut the light off, and then went downstairs to the kitchen. So what do you see him doing in the kitchen, if anything? The next time I see him, he's walking from the kitchen back into the living room, and it looks like he's bringing his hands. He started sort of doing this with his hands in a washing motion. And as he walked towards the Arcadia door, opened the sliding door all the way. Greg testifies that he sees Scott putting on gloves as he approaches Yarmula's body lying next to the pool. Did he actually have the model when he was pulling the model? One hand was already on. He was pulling on the other. Then what happens? He moved her legs around. What he does is he actually then leans sort of into the pool with the gloves that he has on, holds her head and sticks it down in the water, then he goes upstairs. And the police, of course, come out. Greg Coons was the bombshell witness because Scott said he had zero idea how any of this happened. You had one person who was able to testify, this is what I saw. And a lot of the things that Greg Coons saw were damning. Now let me take you to 1996. We didn't dispute the fact that he was the one that, that stabbed her 44 times. And uh, it was perplexing. Why did this happen? They consider themselves to be each other's best friends. I mean, even as reporters, we try to find uh, narratives or through lines as to why a murder would take place. And here there really wasn't a motive, a reason. These were two high school sweethearts who had been married for 20 years, raised two kids from the outside. There was nothing here to suggest any trouble. And there's absolutely no history, any kind of violence or abuse from either side in this particular family. All you know about the two people that were devoted to one another and loved one another. And that's why this whole thing is such a senseless act. After Yarmulef later is murdered, Scott's family is totally bewildered. This is not their mild-mannered, non-violent son or brother until they remember that Scott used to sleepwalk as a child. And she said, I just picked her up and threw her across the kitchen. I don't remember that incident at all either. In the early summer months of 1999, about two and a half years after the killing, Scott Felater's facing the death penalty in a crime that he says he committed, but he's not responsible for. In Phoenix this morning, testimony resumes in the bizarre murder trial of Scott Felater, an otherwise mild-mannered engineer. Felater admits stabbing his wife for first-degree murder charges. This father of two insists he's not guilty. Juan Martinez had a pretty slam dunk case. He had an eyewitness. I saw a person laying on the ground. He had damning evidence. And everyone in the courtroom is wondering what on earth will Scott Felater's defense be? I didn't see what our defense was going to be. We know he did it. And then the question was, what caused it? 
When we first went in and met the attorney, he had been planning to plead Scott as, as guilty but mentally insane. What did you think of that? Oh, I was outraged. <laughs> I was outraged. I said, they're, they're, my brother is not an insane person. There, there's no way you could prove that he's insane. Scott's mother and sister are racking their brains, trying to figure out what went wrong. How could this be? When they remember that Scott used to sleepwalk as a child. As I sat and thought about it, I remembered several instances where he did walk in his sleep. And I, I mentioned that to Lori. So I got on the internet and got as much information together as I could before I meet with the attorney. And didn't talk to Scott about this at all. Mostly because we wanted to be sure that this was a, this was a certain possibility. Because it sounded so ridiculous. I was willing to consider it. Then you wanted to know, did he have a history where there was sleepwalking? And Scott did. There were several times he came down the stairs, fully dressed, and walked into the living room, and he was all ready for school, and it was like midnight. Then one time he came down the stairs, and he was probably over 15 or 16, and he was stark naked. And the next day, you'd ask him about it or, or talk to him about it. He had absolutely no idea that this happened. And it was kind of a family joke. It wasn't any big deal. But his sister recalled a time he was violent during a sleepwalking episode. I was 20 years old, just a month or so before I was getting married. I was going through finals in college, and I guess it was a stressful time. He uh, went to bed early that night. I stayed up. I was watching The Tonight Show. Are you really applauding me or the fact that you don't live in Buffalo? <laughs> and he came walking out kind of behind me. And I said, Scott, what are you doing? He didn't answer me. And then he started walking toward the back door. She thought, oh, he's sleepwalking. So she ran in front of him to lock the door leading out from the kitchen to the outside. When I did that, I brushed against his shoulder and he turned around and he grabbed me by my shoulders and just tossed me. And she said, I just picked her up and threw her across the kitchen. I don't remember that incident at all. He looked just so angry, he looked almost demonic. He just was, I have never seen him look like that, never. Was that the only time you can remember Scott being violent with you or anyone? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. It was about two months before he and Yarm were gonna get married. He was getting ready for either midterms or finals at school. He was under a lot of stress. He just looked really tired. He would get circles around his eyes. Experts don't know exactly what causes an episode in those prone to sleepwalking, but almost all sleep experts agree that stress and sleep deprivation can trigger sleepwalking episodes in those with sleep disorders. My father's job at the time that my mother passed, he was working on a product for Motorola. He had a team of engineers, and I think he had come to the conclusion that the product wasn't going to succeed and that they might have to just scrap it and, and start over and start somewhere new. And he was extremely concerned about how this would affect the well-being of his crew, of his staff. He had a seminary class he was teaching six in the morning. He was spread very thin. The defense tried to say that this was not Scott Flater acting consciously, that this was a monster emerging from the depths of his pressure cooker. Sleepwalking is triggered by stress when a person can be under a great deal of stress. And it can also be triggered by sleep deprivation when you're very tired or just worn out. I never bought the defense of killing while he was, you know, sleepwalking or asleep. Not to sound flippant, but I kind of smirked. I'm like, are you kidding me? Sleepwalking? The actions during the episode are often illogical and somewhat nonsensical. Really? This is kind of like almost hand in the cookie jar type thing. You got caught, dude. The behavior isn't voluntary without intent. And I just thought, yeah, it's a bunch of bull. The level of consciousness is impaired. The evidence is also clear that he was the one that stabbed. 
Diane Sawyer and Charles Gibson. Good evening and welcome to 2020 Wednesday. The case is big news. 2020 actually devoted multiple segments to it. Well, what do you think of this as a defense strategy for killing a spouse? An Arizona man set out to convince a jury that he stabbed his wife 44 times while sleepwalking and doesn't remember a thing. It got a lot of attention. It was a front page story. People were talking about it because it required and was based upon an attempt to penetrate the mysteries of the human mind and the privacy of an American family that apparently was living the American dream. The jury was faced with an astonishing question. Did Scott Folater kill his wife in his sleep? Scott himself initially said he thought that that was a crazy notion. Inside, I just felt it was a bunch of BS. It was just very simple and pure BS, and it had no basis in reality. I am an engineer. I knew there were tests that could be done in a hospital which would prove it with numbers. And so I was going to wait for those tests, which would tell me for sure. See what happens when Scott goes to sleep with a camera watching. You're going to stab your wife 44 times. You're out of your mind. Are you kidding me? Sleepwalking? The defense tried to say that this was a monster emerging from the depths of his unconscious. Interrupting anyone in... You know, not everyone can say that their father stabbed their mom and held her in a pool of water, but that's where I am. I couldn't knowingly kill her. No one deserved it less than anyone that I know. Do you believe your wife has forgiven you? The husband just threw, I believe, the wife in the pool. The male next door threw his wife in the pool, and now he's holding her down on the water. She is floating in the water. Two years after he stabbed his wife to death, Scott Filater went to trial here in Phoenix. His sole defense was sleepwalking. He says he has no memory of the brutal attack. When he stabbed his wife to death. They have a genetic defect in the brain between deep sleep and arising into dreaming sleep. Scott Filater said he was sleepwalking. Sleepwalking. Was sleepwalking. The entire time. That defect means they can get up and not be awake and behave strangely. Never, ever wake up a sleepwalker. See? I'm waking him up. No. What most people knew about sleepwalking came from like situation comedies. Ralph, Ralph, my head's gone. He's walking in his sleep again. <laughs> Someone just walking around with their hands out and their eyes closed. Steve? <laughs> you really knew what the research.
church is showing and what can happen, you wouldn't be joking about it. They're enormously strong, that it's not just one stab wound, it's 44 stab wounds. Another thing that's common is they don't recognize the person they've attacked. There's no face recognition. The closest analogy I've been able to come up with to it in my mind is that it's like an accidental killing. This was no accident. 44 stab wounds, uh, putting your head under water in a pool. I tell you, I did not do that intentionally. I did not plan to do anything like that. I did not wake up and do something like that. If I had woken up, something, I would have been totally horrified. It was a brutal eruption of vicious violence from a man who was known as mild-mannered, which was a, a perception that added credibility to the notion, well, maybe he was asleep. Nearly a year after killing his wife, Scott Filator is escorted from his jail cell to a nearby hospital to undergo a sleep study. He was in shackles, so I could hear him coming down the, the hallway. He was accompanied by two guards that stayed with me the entire night. Over four nights, he's wired up to electrodes and monitors that measure the depth and quality of his sleep. In the end, though, the results are ambiguous. The defense says they do show that Scott Filator has a propensity for sleepwalking, but the state says they do not. The defense brings in two heavyweight sleep experts. I uh, direct the Sleep Disorders Center. A PhD doctor, yeah. yes, and yeah. director of their Sleep Disorders Service. Dr. Roger Broughton and Dr. Rosalind Cartwright. They are leaders in the field of sleepwalking violence. Their names are on scientific studies and in textbooks. I wouldn't say that I was a little concerned. I would say there was a lot concerned. They hired two of the, uh, what I consider to be prominent experts in the field. And so I knew that uh, there was some viability to that defense. And it's something that I knew that I had to combat. The two had just finished working on a sleepwalking defense case in Canada, where that defendant was acquitted. During the trial, five psychiatrists testified that Parks could have been sleepwalking when he drove from Pickering to Scarborough and killed his mother-in-law and wounded his father-in-law. And after a trial where Dr. Broughton was a key witness saying, yeah, I believe he was sleepwalking, the man was acquitted. The Park case provides something that, that you can tell a jury to look at and say, see, it is possible. You have conducted an evaluation of Scott Follater in this case, have you not? Yes, I have. And have you reached an opinion regarding whether he was sleepwalking at the time uh, he killed his wife? It's my strong belief that that was the case. Do you have an opinion whether Scott Follater was in a sleepwalking state when he stabbed his wife? Uh, in my opinion, he was. Scott's case is really about as pure a case as you can find. A pure case of a sleepwalking violence case at its purest form. He was walking around like with a bomb in him that could go off and he just didn't know it was there. And I understand people's reluctance um, to... But he and his sleepwalking experts speculate as to how this killing might have happened. Sleep deprived and stressed out from problems at work, Scott crashes into bed and then rising in a sleepwalking state. Wife well, missed him and got up to find him and bring him back. The Yarmula comes and interrupts him. On his shoulder. You know, honey, come back to bed. He sees her not as his wife, but as some threat that his instinctual brain responds to while he's asleep. And Lunch in the cars. Officers who searched the Filator home tell the jury how they spotted... It's an incredible defense. A Phoenix man says he was sleepwalking when he stabbed his wife 44 times and then drowned her in their pool. 
Today, the Sleepwalker murder trial erupts with dramatic testimony. The Maricopa County prosecutor is about to call his own witnesses to try to prove that Scott Filator was not sleeping. Do you uh, work for? City of Phoenix Police Department. And what unit are you in? Homicide. Is presented about what Scott Filator was doing when he supposedly sleepwalks his way toward killing his wife. When detectives go in to search Scott Filator's vault in the trunk of the Volvo station wagon. Once you opened that up, did you find anything? It, yes, I did. Inside that compartment, they find the mother load of evidence. What did you find? A black plastic trash bag. And um, anything in and around this black plastic trash bag? It was not Exhibit A. It was Exhibit 15, the most innocent thing you can possibly imagine. A Tupperware container. Recognize it? What is it? It's the honey knife that was found inside the Tupperware container. That was the murder weapon. Voila. There we are. Everything we're looking for. We just hit the jackpot. One of the strong points of the prosecution was sleepwalkers have no need to hide anything because they don't know that what they're doing is any way out of the ordinary. They're just zombies. With a sense of logic, and neither can he, poor soul. Now, Prosecutor Juan Martinez begins to cross-examine the defense sleepwalking experts. Those are your notes, right? Juan Martinez was looking for anything where he could get the expert to cast doubt on his own thoughts. And Juan Martinez was able to effectively do that. The evidence suggests that Scott Filator had a pretty busy evening that night, especially for someone who was supposedly asleep. In and out of the house, up and down the stairs, changing clothes before the stabbing and then again after. And so now you know that he's changed clothing at least twice and maybe three times. Does that give you even a little bit more pause? It, uh, the, just the change of clothes gave me pause. It gave him pause that Scott for later changed clothes. And putting the clothes back in the trunk, uh, which I thought was, was an unusual feature for sleepwalking. It gave him pause the intricate way that the clothes were hidden. So getting an expert to raise doubts about his own thoughts was very effective for Juan Martinez. Then the prosecutor calls his own sleepwalking expert to the stand, Dr. Mark Pressman. A sleep expert with a sort of street edginess about him. He was completely dismissive of the idea that all of this could have happened while Scott Filator was asleep. First of all, what is your opinion as to whether or not back on January 16th of 1997 when he stabbed his wife, whether or not the defendant was sleepwalking. I think all the evidence says he was awake, and all the evidence says that his behaviors were far too complicated to be sleepwalking. Well, so many complex acts happen between the beginning and the end. We have almost 45 minutes here, and I've actually broken it down. I have a list of, a, of 64 separate behaviors from the beginning to the end. Far too complex, he testified, for someone to do all of those things in his sleep. In your experience, do sleepwalkers tend to conceal objects? Is that something that they do, uh, generally speaking? Sleepwalkers may misplace items, but to my knowledge, sleepwalkers uh, never hide something. And these items were not only hidden, they were, they were packed. Awake came after he stabbed his wife. He returned to Yarmula's body and dragged her over to the pool, held her under. A second act of violence. The only way that sleep specialists think that violence can happen with a sleepwalker is that somebody confronts them, physically confronts them, gets in their way. That's clearly impossible on, on the second episode of violence. The victim was laying there near death. Clearly, she didn't get up and get, get in his way. When sleepwalkers become violent, they don't go out seeking someone to be violent with. The prosecution had people who are not the best sleepwalking experts. They spoke with excessive certitude, in my opinion, which you would find in someone who really doesn't quite know what he's talking about. In this case, Juan Martinez has everything a prosecutor could ask for. He's got the weapon. He's got an eyewitness. There's just one thing he hasn't got, and it's something he really wants, a motive. And suddenly, it seems to appear a phrase Scott for later used unforgivable sin. Whatever this unforgivable sin is, he can't wait to be rid of her. All right, please. 
Day four of the sleepwalking murder trial takes some interesting twists and turns. Watch enough trials and you'll see a jailhouse snitch testify. They clink into the courtroom in handcuffs and leg irons and they testify for the prosecution. But not in this case. Two of Scott Folater's cellmates testified for the defense. While he was in jail, cellmates said that they heard unusual activity and saw him appearing to walk in his sleep. He was like in a daze. And then he walked straight for the cell door. He looked out the door, and I remember saying, what's the matter, what's going on? All of a sudden, I heard this noise and this movement, you know, and Scott got up, went over to the door, and shook the heck out of the door, just like, you know, just shaking, you know, and, it's, and I said, Scott, is there something wrong? He never answered me. Were they making it up? I always had kind of doubts about their testimony a little bit. We still went ahead and used them anyway. All right, you excuse things. How are you acting? This really called Michael Butler. I think the other witnesses that were very powerful were the kids when Megan and Michael took the stand defending their father. Would you please uh, tell us your name? Michael David Fuller. And is your dad Scott Blair? Yeah. I don't know how I did it. I know I had to be strong. I know I had to tell the truth and answer the questions. And uh, I believe that's what I did. And you're aware that your dad has been charged with the first degree yes, murder of your, of your mother? Yes. Yeah. It has to enter the jury's mind. What do the kids think? Do the kids buy this? Do the kids believe their father was a sleepwalker? Do the kids believe their father was capable of cold-blooded murder? Did your mom and your dad love each other? Yes. Did you ever see your dad have much of a temper over the years? No. Have you ever seen him blow up and get mad? Well, I've seen him angry before, but I've never actually seen him go into a rage or you know, do anything. They were very clear that they had loved their mother, but they loved their father. And, you know, they didn't blame him and they were supportive. Your Honor, next witness will be the defendant, uh, Scott Folater. The biggest witness was Scott Folater himself. Defendants rarely take the witness stand. Why don't they take the witness stand? It's usually a really bad idea. We had a difficult time accepting the fact that you were the one that stabbed him. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it took me a very long time, probably several weeks before I could really even admit it openly to myself. Yeah, I had actually done that. <laughs> Why did he take the witness stand? He had to. The cases where you take the stand are cases where you have no criminal record and you have to convince the jury of your state of mind. And the only thing on trial was his state of mind. No, not at all. I couldn't knowingly kill her. No one deserved it less of anyone that I know than her. Do you have any memory at all of stabbing? No, no, I do not remember doing that. The hard questions come during cross-examination. Prosecutor Juan Martinez tries to show that the later marriage wasn't so happy. He reminds Scott Filater that a co-worker testified Filater had called his wife Dumpy. Scott made a comment, you know, dumpy girls, you know, make really good wives and mothers, you know. Did he, did he use the word dumpy or Well, I'm not sure it was the word dumpy or overweight, but, you know, he was trying to say that, you know, you didn't have to have a, a perfect woman or a perfect girl to be a good mother or a good wife. Take a look at that woman. Does that woman appear to you to be dumpy? She is not dumpy, sir. The word dumpy was never my word. In fact, he did several times where he took witnesses' words and put them in my mouth. The prosecutor, Juan Martinez, who had been grasping for a motive throughout this trial, seized on a remark made in the notes of a psychologist who'd interviewed Scott Folater in jail. See that up there? Yes, I do. A phrase Scott used during their conversation. It does say unforgivable sin, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Juan made the biggest thing out of this that somehow 
Yarmula had committed a, some kind of a horrible something suggesting unfaithfulness by Yarmula. And he kept trying to grind on that to make that a motive. When you say unforgivable sin, it suggests that she had cheated on Scott Felater. But that's really not the case, is it? I'm not suggesting that uh, anybody committed the uh, sin of adultery. I, I can't get into uh, Mr. Felater's head and look to see what he considered to be an unforgivable sin. It is his phrase. So when you uttered the word unforgivable sin, what did you mean? I felt that perhaps I had committed the unforgivable sin by killing Yara. And that obviously was bothering me a lot. When a defendant takes the stand, the whole case starts to hinge on the defendant's testimony. Does the jury like the defendant or not? Does the jury believe the defendant or not? And if they don't, then you've lost your case. All right, please. Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you yesterday, uh, now's the time for the uh, lawyers to give innocently kill his wife in his sleep, or did he fake it to cover up her murder? This was the person in his life. This was his soulmate. This was his friend. This was his companion. She meant everything to him. This was his emotional support. If you don't go out and you have someone like that, you kill him. This guy here killed his wife, and he's guilty of first degree murder. Okay, this is Mike Riley. I would need hands. Who wants to ask questions? Jerry. Summarize for us the, your deliberations and tell us how you reached your verdict. Hours of deliberations before the jurors sent word to the judge they had a verdict. I had a press buddy who was a local reporter, and he called and said, the jury has a verdict. Let the record reflect the presence of all counsel, the defendant, and all members of the jury. Boy, the courtroom was packed when the jury came back. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been informed that you have a verdict, and uh, is that true? Rolling tape. Quiet, please. Jurors are under no obligation to explain themselves, but in the strange case of Scott Felater, some were persuaded to sit down with 2020 correspondent Connie Chung to reveal what went on in the jury room. When you were first seated as jurors, how did you view this case? Well, I have to admit my first impression was sleepwalking. Yeah, right. But then I realized that uh, I really didn't know anything about sleepwalking. Wanted to believe that it wasn't that it couldn't be premeditated murder. The guy could not actually go out and kill his wife like that. They took an immediate vote after they went back to deliberate. And the first vote was eight to four. Four people were not in favor of convicting. The major issue was, was he or was he not sleepwalking, which was really was the decision we were making. If he was not sleepwalking, he was then guilty. If he was sleepwalking, he was not guilty. I, I really didn't have a good explanation at all for anything like this to have happened. When Scott Felater took the stand and swore that he did not remember what happened that night, how many of you believed him? A number of them said that after Scott Felater had testified that they were swayed to his side. You know, all I could come up with was, you know, maybe there's a tumor in my head or, you know, or something really bad happened in my head. Some of the jurors afterwards said, you know, he came across as really sympathetic to me. I saw, saw Scott Felater as a very credible witness telling an incredible story. I thought he believed the answers that he was giving. Did you have any thought in your mind or any intent in your mind to kill Yarba? Uh, no way. No way. It's anyway, the nice furthest thing. thing from my mind. He came across as honest. And actually, when he testified, I was swayed back. You know, like, how could this man do this, do this to his wife? You were believing him? Mm-hmm. I was believing him. The why of this case has been the key question since the night of the murder.
it's the question the homicide detective kept asking Scott in that interview room. Why? What did she do to send you off like that? Nothing. My initial thought on the Scott Folater case was someone would come forward and say, well, there's, there was this affair at the office. Turns out there's an insurance policy. And then nobody came forward to say that there was any other explanation, there was any other motive. No, the prosecutor doesn't have to prove motive, but if the prosecutor can establish motive, it sure goes a long way to meeting the standard of criminal intent. The prosecution never established anything that even faintly resembled a motive. That is, in essence, what made our decision so difficult. And they then hashed things out, and then it came down to 10 to 2. And there were sleepwalking when the initial attack with a knife happened. It was a second act of violence that really swayed most people. Some of the jurors were saying, OK, maybe I'll buy that you were asleep while stabbing your wife. But I'm not buying the idea that in your hands, he could get the death penalty. The jury comes back on Friday morning. They send that message to a judge. That they've announced a verdict. Hey, Mr. Riley, if you could please hand off the verdict forms to Heather. And it's handed over. The judge looks at it, and then the verdict is read. We, the jury, duly and panel and sworn in the above entitled action, upon our oaths, do find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree. It was a traumatic moment for all of us. The jurors didn't just reject your sleepwalking defense. They believe that you planned this murder, that it was premeditated. I would say, you know, thank you for your hard work, but frankly, guys, you got it wrong. Um, I, I am not a monster. I am not a murderer. I would say these jurors needed a higher level of sophistication. I think they, it took, because you're having to understand science, you had to understand that the whole field of sleep disorders is an evolving field. The average person probably is not qualified to come up with the correct decision, certainly in the face of so much uh, gobbledygook thrown in by the prosecutor. Uh, it takes a very intelligent person to see through all of that. They're grasping. Personally, I, I, I find that extremely insulting. Yes, yes that's well, very insulting. insulting. I guarantee you that my lack of education had nothing to do with a guilty verdict. What convicted Scott for later was the preponderance of evidence, and that was it. I was extremely worried, you know, about the death penalty. Are you afraid to be put to death? Judge Reinstein had to decide whether or not the death penalty was going to be imposed for Scott Filater. Attorneys that represent people in death penalty cases and have a sentencing where they're facing death, I think there's an anguish in them before that we all feel they're just fear. In a capital punishment case like Scott Filater's, you go through a second sort of mini trial when you're deciding whether or not you're going to impose the death penalty or a life sentence. Both sides present testimony, including friends, family, and people who knew Scott from church, asking the judge to spare his life. He was thoughtful and caring about other people. I definitely see him as a teacher and a role model for people around him. I don't believe the death penalty is appropriate for this man. The state needs to show there was a night. And the children also pleaded for their father's life. They had already lost their mom. They didn't want to lose their dad. Um, I'd like to tell the judge that 
Um, I like that I love him more than anything else in the world. And I'd like to be with him again sometime. Michael said, I love him more than anything else in the world. And he had some tears coming silently down his cheek. And so did more than a few people watching the trial. And then Scott Filator himself, before the judge who will decide his fate, defending his own life. I accept the responsibility that it was I that killed her. I'm certainly sorry for the pain that Aaron must have felt that night. With the victim's relatives pleading for lenience from the judge, it did seem to weigh on him. It is ordered that the defendant be sentenced to serve the remainder of his natural life in the Department of Corrections. Dated this 10th day of January. His sentence was life without parole. He did not give the death penalty. In the end, he was sentenced to life in prison. Now, more than two decades later, you may wonder what's become of the man who claimed he killed in his sleep. And we're just waiting for them to let us in. Got it. This is Scott Belater today, serving that life sentence in an Arizona prison. Hello. I was able to briefly speak with him via video conference. It's a rare opportunity because typically Arizona does not allow TV interviews with inmates. We're in the middle of a pandemic and I understand you were personally impacted by COVID-19. Back in June, I got very sick and I'm still getting my sense of smell and taste back even after all this time. Scott, your children, Michael and Megan, they both supported you during your trial. What is your relationship like with them today? Uh, my daughter has not talked to me in some time. She said, coming to visit you, I feel so bad afterwards. And I told her, you know what, move on. Do what you have to do to live a good life. I couldn't be prouder of both of them. Whether they want to talk to me or not, I still it's my, will go to my grades extremely proud of both of them. wondered how the kids were doing, you know, hoping for the best for him, you know. The first time you spoke to your father after your mother died, do you remember what he said to you? He said that he was proud of us and that he loved us. My father was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, which my understanding is that he will, he will die in prison. 
When we started revisiting the Scott Filater case, we first contacted the Filater children. Megan Filater chose not to take part in this program. Michael is now an attorney in Las Vegas, and he has a family of his own. In the 20 plus years since I've lost my mom, I think about her every day. I think about what she could be doing with my kids now, what life could have been like, and things that I've missed out on. After all these years, I really want to say to those kids, good job for everything you've accomplished in life. Oh, way to go. Hi, right, sweetheart. Hey, Dad. How are you? Pretty good. 2020 was there back in 1999 when the Filater kids visited their father in jail. And now, two decades later, 2020 is there again. This time, it's Michael visiting with his father in prison. Hey, Mike. Hey, how are you, Dad? He's still my dad, and I hope to always have that relationship with him, whether he's in prison or, or he's out. You know what I miss was when we would go out on Christmas Eve and buy stuff for mom. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, I miss that stuff. Being out, just being with you guys. Yeah. He teaches parenting classes. He's worked with a local community college to bring in vocational training for other inmates so that they can learn uh, job skills. One footnote about the man who fought so hard to send Scott Filater to prison, former Maricopa County prosecutor Juan Martinez. He went on to win convictions in other high-profile murder cases, including Jody Arias. She's the one that did the stabbing. She's the one that shot him. But then came allegations of ethics violations and sexual harassment of female law clerks in his office. Martinez continues to deny those allegations, but in 2020, he consented to being disbarred, voluntarily giving up his license to practice law. All right, I see it says we have five minutes left here. I saw that too. I love you Thank too, you. Dad. Yeah. I love you. I love you, Mike. Okay. Okay, you take care. You too. 20 years later, when I think of Scott Filater, it is still a complete and total mystery to me as to what the hell happened that night. Maybe that's the appeal of why this case is still being talked about, is all these years later, I can't give you a definitive answer as to what I think happened in that backyard. I can't tell you for sure whether the man was asleep or not. I think we all have a sense that we are capable of performing as human beings acts of great dignity and occasionally acts of, uh, of great violence. And Scott Filater was a figure capable of both. Prudence does not mean how.